So I watched the Cloverfield Paradox the other day, and it is really, really bad. Direct to Netflix and set in the Cloververse. The Cloverfield Paradox sets out to explain the events of the previous two films in the series. Even though nobody asked for that, and the previous movies were never made with any of the concepts of this film in mind. If that doesn't already set the bar pretty low, you're in for even more of a surprise because this movie is a hot mess. Keeping with the new trend set by 10 Cloverfield Lane, this was supposed to be a completely unrelated sci-fi movie, but then JJ came around and was like, hey, cool sci-fi movie but it's Cloverfield now. It was more apparent in the previous movie, since all the Cloverfield-related content in 10 Cloverfield Lane is basically just the bad parts of the movie. The movie's really good up until the very end when SHIT DECIDES TO GO FUCKING CRAZY! But why is this movie bad? Well, there are a lot of reasons, and we're gonna have to watch the whole thing in order to really break it down, so let's go, I guess. The first thing we hear is radio news chatter about how the Earth is running out of energy and supplies or whatever. I think it's pretty widely accepted that this is a really lazy and uninspired way to lay out the setting of your movie. We don't even get anything to fucking look at. It's just a black screen with audio. This is really fucking lazy. Right after that, we get a really slow and awkward scene with our main character, Ava Hamilton, and her husband waiting in line for gas. The energy in this scene is fucking non-existent. It feels like the editor accidentally made this the first scene. Most of the time, tense thriller movies like this start with something a little more interesting, you know? I mean, shit, let's look at the two movies that preceded this one. Cloverman Origins starts with this cryptic government shit and jumpy found footage to get you through the setup in an engaging way. You also get to meet all the characters and learn a little bit about them before shit starts going off the walls. 10 Clover Guy Street starts off with a really well edited sequence of the main character running away from home and getting hit by a fucking car. I love this opening because it's a really good example of wordless storytelling, which as you guys might know is a thing I'm very fond of. You gotta get your audience hooked, alright? I saw these movies in theaters, so I kinda had to watch the rest of it whether I liked the opening or not. But if this shit is boring, guess what? I'm at home in my pajamas, motherfucker, and I'm gonna turn on Mystery Science Theater instead. I mean, that didn't happen. I watched the whole thing, and that's why we're here right now. So anyway, right after this boring ass intro, you get the most abrupt montage with people on a spaceship. You get the exposition that these characters are all up in space, flying around in a giant hadron collider or something, and they're trying to manipulate reality in order to generate infinite energy. Yeah, that's a really good idea. What could go wrong there? Right off the bat, at the 15 minute mark, we get this dude on the news explaining how if everything goes wrong on the space station, then reality will be forever warped, and all of past, present, future, and even alternate realities will be corrupted, leading to monsters and demons emerging. This experiment could unleash chaos. Monsters, demons, beasts from the sea. To clarify. So that's it. These guys messed up, and the monsters pop up in the other movies because of that. That's it, the movie's over, guys. Wrap it up. So 15 minutes into the movie, you know the whole point of the fucking movie. I'm not kidding. I watched the whole thing, and it really just boils down to what this guy says. They fuck up on their giant spaceship, they unleash the monsters. That's the movie. This is baffling to me. I truly can't understand why the reveal is literally right in the beginning of the fucking movie. Having this information trickle down and be delivered to the viewer organically is obviously too difficult. So far, all of the exposition that we've gotten has been from the news broadcasts. We literally just started this movie and it's treating us like we're idiots. So anyway, they try to charge up the space station and it turns out that I was wrong. Nothing bad happens. They succeed and they can all go home now. No, I'm just kidding. It obviously does not work. Shit starts like exploding and stuff. So they look out the window and they realize that the Earth is gone. So then they start trying to fix the ship so they could, you know, find the Earth. But then... Gotcha, scared you. Now you might think that this means there's some kind of monster on the ship. That's what I thought. What the fuck else could that be? But no, it's just a person. It's a lady who's stuck in the walls. How the fuck did she make that noise? Humans can't sound like that. So the lady in the wall says Hamilton's name and now everybody's like, what the fuck, that's weird. Who the fuck is this lady and how does she know us? Ooh, how interesting. I wonder what's gonna happen next. What? What's happening here? And this is where things start to get kind of messy. So this movie is basically split into two narratives. The people in space trying to get home and Hamilton's husband running around on Earth. 
Now his storyline is kind of meant to evoke the feelings of the previous two movies. Cause like, see right here, he's in the first movie. Ooh. And look now here, he's in the second movie. Do you get it? But overall, it's kind of pointless. It sets up the twist in the end, but his story is really awkwardly cut and it doesn't serve the narrative of the other storyline at all. So anyway, back to the stupid spaceship. Any ideas? Because honestly, I'm stumped. So let me get this straight. Everybody on this ship speaks this lady's language. They speak Mandarin or whatever. And she speaks English, but she doesn't speak it. She never says a single word in English. She just refuses to speak it. So for the rest of this review, I'm going to refer to this woman as Chewbacca. You said it, Chewie. You may also notice at this point that other than Hamilton, we have no characterization from any of these people. They tell us really, really briefly that Baron Zemo and Chewie are dating, but that isn't really made very clear. Aside from a short argument they have, they don't really act like they have that much of a connection. Hell, I don't even know everybody's names. There's a way to do a space thriller and make the audience care about the characters. A woman appears in the wall, we're definitely not in Kentucky anymore. Kansas. Kansas. Really? Who gives a shit? Wow, that line was really bad. Ooh, look at this. Another shot of the foosball table. I wonder if the foosball table is gonna be important later. Uh-huh, yep. Okay, so the Russian guy goes to the little boy's room because he's not really feeling so good, and his eye does one of these things. Yeah, man, I hate when that happens. Also, he starts talking to someone that we can't see or hear in the mirror, and it's implied that it's like a voice in his head or something. Spoilers, this is never brought up again in the film. So the voice apparently told him to go to the 3D printer and print a gun. Can you just do that? That should not be allowed. That shouldn't even be a feature on the spaceship. Even the characters react the same way. They act like he should not have a gun, like it's not even possible. Pam, why do you have a gun? Now there's a gun? Since when is there a gun? Either they didn't know it was possible, or it isn't possible, and he just did it anyway. Honestly, knowing this movie, it could go either way. So he waves his little airsoft pistol around for a bit, and then he starts the obligatory alien chest burster scene. Yeah! Also, let's take note that they put the gun in this little cupboard here, okay? That's gonna be important later when the movie's being stupid. So the wall lady wakes up and it becomes clear to the slower members of the audience that the main universe has accidentally merged with another universe. This lady was on the space station in her universe when she got spliced into their ship. That also explains the worms getting spliced into the Russian, sort of. But here's the thing. Later on, they reveal that her spaceship ended up crashing two days beforehand. How did she get popped into this ship if she was technically supposed to be among the crew on the crashed ship? She also seems to know the condition of the Earth in the time between the crash and now. How does she know that? If you take her later explanation that their universe has sort of collided and just assume that their ships crashed into each other, how did they end up on the other side of the fucking sun afterwards? Her being here at all makes absolutely no sense, even under the assumption that it isn't supposed to make sense. So anyway, she says that they shouldn't trust Baron Zemo because in her reality, he betrayed them. So they lock him up in the brig. However, space magic opens the door anyway, and he just gets out. This is never explained. So it's just added to the list of things that don't matter at all and are just in the movie to fill time. Also, real quick, we cut back to Mr. Hamilton, and he's just walking around in a war zone for the hell of it, and he hears the screams of a horrifying monster. Oh wait, I forgot this movie thinks I'm fucking stupid, so the monster screams were just coming from a little girl. Whatever, man, I just don't fucking care anymore. Back on the spaceship, the guy from Bridesmaids gets glitched into the wall like he's in Sonic 06. Also, I'd like to really quick point out that there's a weird reoccurring element in these types of movies. In any kind of, like, space horror film, they have a random comedy actor in them. Ryan Reynolds was in Life, Alien Covenant has Danny McBride. Do they really think that we won't be able to connect to the movie if there isn't, like, a funny man? That's really stupid. Anyway, the wall is feeling extra cheeky and it decides to just keep the guy's arm. And then they find out that his arm is now crawling around the spaceship. That's my fucking arm. What the fuck is happening right now? You may be seeing a reoccurring theme with the scenes in this film. Basically, shit just happens, and it's all chalked up to space shenanigans. Here's why this movie doesn't work. The plot is pushed forward on the sole concept that nothing makes sense. 
This guy speaking mysterious shit in the mirror, never explained. This guy's arm being intelligent and writing down plot details for them, never explained. Chewbacca going on to get locked in a flooded room, never explained. I get it, they're cosmic anomalies, but instead of it appearing to be cosmic horror, it comes across as silly and strangely convenient. Unless there's a measured attempt to be vague or mysterious, overall the audience should have, you know, closure or satisfaction at the end of a movie. This movie's whole point is that nothing makes sense, and that doesn't work. That's not an excuse. So anyway, the arm tells them to cut open the Russian guy. Monk? Sorry, you can't do this. What? But you're the doctor. What do you mean you can't do it? Man, you're the doctor. Yeah, see, thank you. So when they cut open the Russian guy, they find their spaceship battery that they've been looking for. Honestly, this should make me way more angry since the movie just wants me to accept the fact that this guy was walking around with thousands of worms in his face and a metal basketball in his tummy for hours without dying. But honestly, I have dumber shit to complain about, so I'm not gonna worry about it. So they go ahead and they plug in their battery and they try to get a scan done of their surroundings. Once they reorient themselves, they find out that the Earth that they found is just an alternate Earth, where a war has broken out because the resources are really, really bad. But they decide that instead of going down to the Earth and getting some help or, you know, talking to the scientists down there about their experiments, they're just gonna ignore the whole planet and try to power up their magic spaceship again and get out of there. Even though the last time they did that, it ended up being a really, really bad idea. They have no idea if the spaceship will actually even take them back. What we know about quantum entanglement dictates it should bring us back. You don't know shit about quantum entanglement, whatever that is. You didn't even know that any of this was possible until a few minutes ago. You guys have shuttles. You mentioned it multiple times. They have little shuttles they can use to just jet back down to Earth if they really want to, but they don't want to. They never say why, I guess they just don't feel like it. Anyway, the wall woman wakes up again and she figures out the plot pretty quickly without leaving the room or talking to anybody. And then she says this. Would you mind mentioning to your crew that you're escaping my dimension will trap me in yours? Are you sure about that? They have shuttles. They can just send you down. You can just ask them to do that. What did you even mean when you said that? So now we're about an hour in and the movie realizes that it needs to kill these characters off pretty quickly before we run out of time. Oh no, a spooky weird thing is happening. Okay, so now you're just gonna go walk towards this dangerous situation without turning around and you're just gonna die, right? Yep, uh-huh, that's, that's right. Jesus Christ. Now how much of a beating can this spaceship take before it doesn't work anymore? I'm not kidding, this thing has been totaled, but they never seem to mind. Also, we get a nice little scene here with Hamilton getting some sort of character development. It's an hour into the movie at this point, so I guess it's better late than ever. We find out that she used to have kids, but she left the oven on or something and they blew up. Then the shady wall lady explains that in her universe, Hamilton's kids are still alive. Now you might be thinking, I wonder if this lady, who's making super shady facial expressions and being really ominous, is going to betray everybody. I wonder if she's trying to manipulate Hamilton. Well, yeah, you're right, but it still manages to be pretty stupid. Hamilton's new plan is to go down to the alternate Hamilton and just hang out down there and tell herself not to leave the oven on. When the shocking reveal happens and we find out that Brienne of Tarth is evil, she knocks out Hamilton and goes to shoot everybody. She even explains that she doesn't care if everyone on the ship dies, she just wants to steal the ship and bring it to her Earth and save her planet. But if she was gonna kill everybody anyway, why did she convince Hamilton to shuttle down there? Maybe it's because they're friends? I guess? I mean, I don't know, she's friends with the other guys too. She shows more familiarity with the bald guy and she ices that dude like it's nothing. Also, the ship doesn't even really fucking work that well. Why does Wall Lady want to steal it? Plus, it's been halfway blown to smithereens. This isn't a very good idea, ma'am. Wait a minute, how did you know the gun was in there? How did you know that? You weren't even in the room to see the gun be put in there. How did you know the gun was in the drawer? How did you know the gun was in the drawer? So Hamilton and Captain Phasma fight a little bit and then she kills her and the ship is saved. Hooray! So after all that shit, Hamilton decides that maybe it's a bad idea to fly down to an alternate dimension Earth and just exist with the alternate version of yourself. Instead, she just sends them a voicemail saying, hey, don't accidentally kill your kids. She also sends down the schematics of the space station so the people on that planet can have renewable energy. You seriously could have done that the whole time. 
I guess none of this shit really had to happen then. Just because this shit is going to Netflix doesn't mean you don't have to proofread the script, you chowder heads. Whatever, it doesn't even matter. So Hamilton and Zemo, who survives just through the luck of the draw, I guess, warp back to their planet and everything is great. And they're happy. And her husband finds out and he's happy. Except he isn't. He's actually pretty upset. Tell him not to come back. Well, that's weird. Oh well, I guess it's good to see everything work out well for the main character in the end, considering all of the. Yeah. And yeah, the movie ends like that. The fucking Cloverfield monster pops out looking worse than it did in the first movie. If you think 10 Cloverfield Lane had a bad ending, this one's just insulting. All shit posting aside, even though the story of this movie is bad, ending it with a giant Godzilla monster kind of downplays everything that happens in the movie. I don't think JJ understands that slapping the Cloverfield logo on these movies is actually hurting them. Overall, the Cloverfield series is just kind of weird. Sloppily connected movies that have some cool ideas, but the desperate effort to make them all connected is actually making them worse now. Hell, we're apparently getting another one in October, and that is just crazy to me. Though it'll probably be better than this one, because this movie just don't make no sense. It's entertaining to watch because everything's kind of stupid, but it's not hard to see why this movie's being roasted by critics and casual folks alike. So there, now you don't have to watch it. I saved you a full hour and a half. You're welcome. Oh wow, look at those names on the side of the screen. Who are those guys? Those guys and gals are the reason I have a camera that I use for like five seconds. Thanks guys. If you're watching this, it means you watched the whole video, so thank you. If you liked it, you can give it a thumb or something. If you didn't like it, you can tell me why I'm wrong in the comments. You know you want to. That's all. Okay, bye.